Thanks so much for joining us at the Globe Church. We hope you find this sermon really helpful to you in glorifying God and finding out more about our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not local to London and you're listening in, uh, please do, we encourage you to go and find a local church where you can worship God together with a church family local to you. If you are in London, please do come and find us. You can find all the information about where we meet, when we meet on our website. So come and join us. We'd love to say hello. Uh, we'd love to worship together with you. But for now, we hope you enjoy the sermon and you find this really helps you in your walk with the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's continue in our worship. Commands all the hosts of heaven. Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What are the beauty demands such praises? What are the splendor that shines the sun? What are the majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold the one and the only God, help us to come to you in worship of you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Well, please do take a seat. Uh, and just to let you know of a few things that are going on in the life of the church. Before I get there, uh, just to welcome you again, if you are new here or if you've joined us recently, uh, we love to say hello and we really love to welcome you to the Globe Church. Um, so over there at the back, you'll see there's a new here banner. Um, so straight after the service, if you grab some food and head, head over that way, Micah and Laura, and who are just over here waving their hands, they're going to be back there as well. They are super friendly people, super lovely people. I mean, we all are, but they are particularly friendly and lovely, so please do go and see them. Um, and if you're a student, you can go and say hi to them as well. But there are also Sam and Susie, who are on the student team, who are just here, who will also be over that way. And please head over and say hi. They'd love to, to welcome you and let you know what's going on in, in the student ministry here at the, at the Globe Church as well. Um, Second thing to say, if you are perhaps new to Christian things, if you're new to church or if you joined us recently and you're still exploring things or perhaps you're quite new to Christianity and you want to find out a little bit more, uh, we'd love to help you in that. So we have a, a, a course, a three-week, um, three-session course um, that starts on the 16th of October. It's called Globe Connect. Um, there you go. The, those are the dates there. Um, so it's in the Costa Coffee, just opposite Borough Market, um, just down in the basement. So if you head down there, you get a free coffee and a cake, and you get to chat um, and, and ask questions, any questions that you might have about Christianity, about who God is, why we believe in Jesus, and so on. Um, there will be others there as well. So if you feel, find that a bit too much, you can just sit there and listen quietly, just enjoy your cake and your coffee and listen in. Um, you're very welcome to do that as well. And for those of us who are regulars here at the church, why not think of someone you could invite? Um, pray for someone today. Just think, who could I invite? Who could I say, look, why don't you come along and come along with them? Uh, 16th of October, 6.15, at the Costa Coffee just by Borough Market. Um, so that's what's going on uh, for, for lots of new people um, and new things going on there. Now, in the regular life of church, there's a lot more that goes on beyond Sundays. Um, this week, particularly at the start of the month, there's lots of stuff going on. So you can see here, um, tomorrow, Costa Coffee, uh, same in Bar Market, um, International Cafe happens. That's a, a team of people who go to welcome people who are perhaps new to the UK, new to London, who want to learn more English, who understand how this country works. Um, great opportunity for you to, to welcome people, to love them, um, to play some fun games, to befriend them, and to perhaps invite them to church. It's a great ministry there. Um, and then we have Weber Street. That happens on Tuesday nights. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock, uh, where we reach those who are um, homeless in the city. We want to love our city and, and those who really find it hard. Um, so we have guests who come, and we provide food for them, and we provide uh, something from God's Word for them to feed off as well, and just friendship and love uh, for people who really need it. Uh, so there's a couple of things that are going on this week, um, Monday and Tuesday nights, that you can get involved in. Uh, and then the third thing that we'd really love you to get involved in as well is, um, is our Globe Central, which is our central prayer meeting that happens every week. A slight, uh, sorry, once a month, first Wednesday of every month. Slight change this month, uh, and going forwards as well. We're not going to be meeting in that room over there, which is super hot, all times of the year. We're actually going to be meeting here going forwards, which is a great blessing. Uh, so please do head here at 7 o'clock for food, and then we'll start praying around half 7 uh, for about an hour and a half or so. Uh, so lots of... Yes? Yes. Yes. Um, that's right. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So second, third, and fourth. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So um, the Wednesday is Globe Central. Thank you, Linda. Uh, but lots of stuff going on. Uh, if you need more information on that, um, please do find myself or Emma, who's sitting at the front here, who can guide you in the right places, and look out for the email um, as well. Well, that comes out tomorrow. So lots of stuff to be, that's going on, lots of stuff to be praying for, and Kenan is going to come and lead us in our prayers now. Um, thanks, Kenan. Hi, uh, I'm Kenan. If you don't know me, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Part of living as a sinner saved by grace means to live a life of regular repentance. So in our prayer today, there'll be a time for us to reflect and repent to God. Now the silence might feel long, but I ask that you would embrace the time and cherish it, knowing that God hears your prayers, he loves to hear them. Um, the Bible, in fact, commands us to confess our sins to each other as well. So if you're stuck for conversation after the service, and maybe you can share what you've confessed. And with that, I've maybe just guaranteed nobody will talk to me after the service. <laughs> but let's pray together. Psalm 119, verses 137 to 144 read, You are righteous, Lord, and your ways are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. 
Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always right. Give me understanding that I may live. Heavenly Father, you are wholly righteous and therefore perfectly beautiful in all that is good. Your righteousness, like you, is everlasting. From before time began to long after time on this earth will end, your righteousness is the same. Your righteousness is unchanging and is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Therefore, Lord, we thank you for your laws, which you have revealed to us, for they reflect your righteousness. Just as you are righteous, the statutes you have laid down are righteous, always righteous. Your law is true and your law is right. Your law is pure, beautiful and unchanging. Your law teaches us about who you are. And yet, Lord, even as we acknowledge your laws as righteous and true, we know all too well how we have not been able to keep your laws. Your laws point us to our need of a saviour. And so we thank you for Jesus, our perfect, righteous and beautiful saviour. So, Father... Just as King David wrote in Psalm 32, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. We now confess and repent of the sin that is heavy on our hearts, repenting of the ways we have lived without reference to you, indulging our sinful desires and hurting others. We do this knowing that through Jesus, you forgave us and make us clean and whiter than snow. Father, help us to be a church family who regularly repent, confessing our sin to you and each other, carrying each other's burdens with love, patience, and kindness. As we think about our church family, we now lift up to you the International Cafe Ministry. We thank you for the growing team and the opportunity to share your love to people of all nations here in our city. Thank you for the friendships that have already been built with the guests and the good conversations that have happened over the summer. We pray for this coming term and ask you would help the team to continue to deepen these friendships and build new ones. As guests come along to join us on Sunday, we pray that they would feel welcome and be able to ask any questions they may have. Father, we also want to lift up to you Robin Hardiman, our partner in the gospel, who has just started his final year at Oak Hill College. We thank you that he and his wife Maddie were able to get some rest over the summer and also serve together at Hanson Dorset Christian Youth Camp. We ask that you would guide them as they consider what's next after this year, as they talk with churches and mission agencies, that you and your gospel would be what shapes their decisions. Finally, Father, we lift our eyes further afield 
and pray for the Central African Republic that is listed on Open Doors World Watch List. We cry out for peace in this troubled nation. Help the government to tackle the continuing insecurity and show the leaders of militant groups a more peaceable way of living. Meet the needs of all those displaced and facing persecution. Strengthen their faith and may their spirit-filled lives draw many others to you. Protect your children from harm, particularly church leaders, as they face increasing dangers. Continue to help Open Doors local partners in their work, serving Christians in the country. Give them wisdom and strength in all their activities. We pray all these things in Jesus' righteous, beautiful name. Amen. Thanks, Kevin. Terrific. Well, in a moment, um, John is going to come to bring God's word to us. But before that, uh, we're going to stand and sing again, if you're able to. Um, and as we do, the minis and the tinies are going to be heading out into their groups. So if you're a, a mini or a tiny, um, please do start making your way. And as they do, let me just pray for them um, quickly. Father, we pray for our little ones, for the minis and tinies. Pray that they would know of your glory and learn more of your glory, of your goodness um, in, to them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, let's stand, if you're able to, and sing as the music team leads us. He's roaring with 
that that is true that you are the God who is roaring with power you're the God who is the lamb who was slain for us the God of both power and love the God of truth and grace Lord that is what we long for this afternoon that we might know you and hear from you and encounter you Lord please as we turn to your word would your spirit now help us to understand this in Jesus name Amen great please take a seat Amazing. Um, well, my name is John T, and it's my privilege and joy to open up um, the, God's Word uh, with, with you this afternoon. If you haven't got a Bible, there are some at the back. Um, if you'd like one, why not wave a hand, and Alistair's going to come running to you if you'd like. Anyone want a Bible? Yes, you see one down here at the front? See, we do think it's really important that you have a Bible in front of you so that you can check that what we're saying is really what the Bible says. We really don't want you just to believe things because the person at the front says so. We want you to be able to see it for yourself. And if you've got a Bible, then can you turn to page 969? Page 969. And we're going to pick up in the Sermon on the Mount, which is what we've been working through for the last um, few weeks. We've basically done the introduction. Let me give you a previously in the Sermon on the Mount. This is where we've got to. Jesus has brought the kingdom of heaven to earth. It is an incredible, momentous, extraordinary thing that Jesus has done. And we talked about it being a revolution. That Jesus has brought about something extraordinary. The kingdom of heaven has come into the kingdom of this world. And the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching us how to live in that kingdom. What are the values of that kingdom? What is life in that kingdom like? And we've really looked at his introduction where he said, these are the values, that's the Beatitudes. And then he said, if you live this way, you'll be like salt and light. You'll stand out in this world. You'll shine. But now we're going to get to the kind of heart of his sermon. What is the the main thing Jesus wants us to understand? What is the big thing that Jesus says, this is what life in my kingdom is like? And I think it's quite a surprise. Dan, can you turn me down a little bit? I feel like I'm feeding back and I'm going to get louder as we get going. So I really don't want to blast people. Thank you. I think this is a surprise. You see, what Jesus says in verse 17, which we're about to read, is do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. That's what Jesus um, starts with in this kind of explanation of his kingdom. Now that must mean that if you've been listening carefully, you might be in danger of thinking he's come to abolish the law and the prophets. See, if I start my sermon today and I say, look, I don't want you to think that I'm, a, that I'm anti-dogs. That would be a weird way to start unless I'd given you some reason in the lead up to this sermon that you might think I'm anti-dogs, right? 
I don't want you to give the impression I'm anti-dogs. Jesus says, I don't want you to think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Because all this talk of kingdom all sounds very new. It all sounds very exciting. The kingdom of heaven is here. And it would be tempting to think, hooray, the kingdom of heaven has come. We can forget all of the stuff that's gone before. It's something new. But what Jesus is going to do in this paragraph we're going to explore today is he's going to explain to us how his kingdom relates to all that's gone before. The law and the prophets is basically the Old Testament. The first three quarters of your Bible that you're holding. Jesus is going to show us how what he's come to do is not abolishing that, but fulfilling it. And the reason I say this is the heart of his sermon is because if you just keep a finger in chapter 5 and flip over um, two pages, in fact just one page, well I will actually do, at the bottom of page 971, look what Jesus says. He's said a whole load of stuff that we'll explore in the next few months. But at the end of, event, the end of it, chapter 7, verse 12, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish the law of the prophets. What I'm teaching you sums up everything the law and the prophets said. And so Jesus says, you want to understand life in the kingdom of heaven... Look at the law and the prophets, which is slightly surprising for us because there are some things in the law and the prophets which are slightly strange. Okay, let's, let's play the game, obey or not obey. I'm going to give you a command from the Old Testament. You have to decide, do you think this is a command that we should obey or not obey? You happy to play this game? I can tell you're excited. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make it a game that you can play in your head. You don't have to like put your hand, we're not doing any of that. This is just an internal game. You shall not murder. Good, have we all got an answer? <laughs> I'm really hoping your answer is the same as mine. Right. Uh, you, you must not eat shrimps. Is that a command we obey or not obey? You should not harvest to the edge of your field. Is that a command we obey or not obey? Don't wear clothing of two mixed cloths. Oh, these are getting more difficult, right? Don't eat anything with blood in it. How do you decide? Do we just do an arbitrary sort of, well, we sort of like those ones, but those ones, no, let's not do those. How do you decide? I really hope that by the end of this time together, you will have an answer to that and you will know how to decide. <laughs> Big claim. We'll see how we get on. <laughs> Let's read the passage, right? Here's what Jesus says. Look, these are Jesus' words, words from the very lips of our king, our champion, our hero, our God. Let's listen to his words. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a remarkable paragraph. And we're going to have some fun kind of unpacking it together and learning and listening and hopefully being transformed by what Jesus teaches here. I've got two big things I want us to see. Firstly, in terms of the law, as we think of the law and the prophets, the first part of the Bible, Jesus is very clear. He's not abolishing it. He's fulfilling it. Right? You can all see that. It's what he says. 
I've not come to abolish it. There are some things in life that are great to abolish, aren't they? There are some things in life to get rid of. Some of you have never had the joy of going to the dump. Going to the dump is one of life's real joys. As you, know, as you accumulate rubbish in your life, or as you've got, you know, you've got a horrible, you, know, you move into a flat and you've got a horrible kind of disgusting, I won't pick a color because one of you might have it, kind of um, bathroom suite. It's disgusting and you hate it. And one day you get to abolish it, right? You get to smash it out and you put it in. You, it's amazing. You just dump it in the thing. It's like, it's so freeing. You abolished. So to abolish something is so liberating. And do you know what? I think many of us think that that's what Jesus came to do with the law. There was this nasty law that God gave his people. It was hard. And it made life really difficult. And God's people were constantly having to keep the law. And it was all very miserable. But then Jesus come and he's abolished it. Yeah. And now we're free. Isn't it easy to sort of feel like that? Have you ever found yourself thinking, oh, I really wished I lived in the Old Testament times. I really wish I lived under those laws. I wish that I could study Leviticus and Deuteronomy and and then just live it every moment of my life. I just wish that. No, because we think that we are free from that. If that's what you think, you're really wrong. Because Jesus says he's not come to abolish it at all. And the reason this matters is because we think of laws in the wrong way. It's very difficult in our culture and in our world to get excited about law, isn't it? I know some people study it and they love it. Great. What I mean is the highway code, for example. It's very difficult to get excited about the highway code. Very difficult to kind of, you know, come across a 20 mile hour speed limit sign and go, oh, look, look, I love it. I love driving at 20 miles an hour. Can we reduce it? Can we do less? We don't. It annoys us. It's a burden. Now, why they made it 20? And it frustrates us. But when you read law in the Bible, you have to understand that law is a whole different thing. Law is the instruction of a father to their child. Law is the beautiful explanation from God to his people of how life is supposed to work. Here's the remarkable thing. When God's people had the law, they loved it. Right, listen, to, listen to this. Right, The words on the screen. Have a look at this. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is what Moses said. He said, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? If that finished there, we go, yeah, yes, Moses. What other nation is so great as to have their God near them? Look what he says next. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I'm setting before you today? All of them, including shrimps. What other, what other nation is so great as us to have this law, Israel says? It was a privilege. And in fact, I don't know if you were um, paying attention when Kenan was reading from Psalm 119 at the start of his prayer. Where the, the psalmist says, I delight in your commands. Psalm 119 is a psalm, a massive psalm, all about how much the psalmist loves God's law. Oh, how I love your law. I love your law. He doesn't walk into the bathroom and go, what a disgusting colored toilet this law is. He says, I love it. Oh, how I love your law. So the law, as it was originally given, was so good. It was such a precious gift to his people and the law was given to Israel to set them apart from all the other nations to make them different. And at the heart of the law was love. Love God and love one another 
Treat one another with justice. Care for the poor. If you see a nest on the ground with a a bird in it and her young, don't just kill them all. Let the mother go free. (laughs) Wow. Laws that protected the weak, that looked after the vulnerable, laws that were passionate about justice and what is good, this is God's law. And it was supposed to set Israel apart. So don't ever let's think that the law in the Old Testament was somehow this terrible, terrible thing that now has been abolished. No, it's not been abolished. But notice as well that Jesus doesn't say, do not think I've come to abolish the law, I've come to maintain it, or underline it, or repeat it. No, he doesn't say that either. He's not come simply to take the law and to repeat it for the new day. In fact, there was a problem with this law. You see, the law was so good, it was so good, but there was a problem with it. And the problem with the law was that it, the people couldn't live it. Their hearts were continually going astray. God said, live this way, and they said, no, we'll go this way. And so the law, actually, which was supposed to be so good, actually started to condemn them because they broke it. And they found themselves now living under the curse of the law because they couldn't keep it. And so it's very clear that the law, as it was originally given, was never going to be enough. But it was never intended to be. It was always intended for something more. And so what Jesus says is, I've not come to abolish it, I've come to fulfill it. Fulfill is one of Matthew's favorite words. It's how he describes what Jesus is doing. He's already used it like seven times in his gospel. Jesus was born in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophet. Jesus had to escape to Egypt to fulfill the prophet. But what does he mean that he came to fulfill the law? Well, I want you to imagine an acorn. when When you have an acorn, when you hold an acorn, do you see that within that acorn, there's the there's the potential for an oak tree, right? That's cool. You're holding the potential. But it's not an oak tree. But it is sort of. What does that oak tree need to do? What does the acorn need to do? It needs to fulfill its potential. It needs to become what it has the potential to be. So you plant it in the ground and you wait for it to grow and then when you're dead and other people are dead and then your children's children's children will see an oak tree. The oak tree hasn't abolished the acorn, it's fulfilled the acorn, right? So what you have in the law, please really think about this, right? What you have in the law is the potential of the kingdom of heaven, all of it locked up in the law. But it's not the full kingdom of heaven yet. It was limited to one nation, to Israel. It was was only ever an acorn of the law. It was always pointing forward to something greater. Pointing forward to the oak tree that would come. And so when Jesus comes, it's as if he says, all that potential that was locked up in the acorn now has come to full flower in the kingdom of heaven. It's simply reached its potential. I hope you can see why this is exciting. This is what we, how we should treat the Old Testament law. All of it, all of Jesus' teaching finds itself rooted in the Old Testament. He sees all of it locked up within the acorn of the law. And he says, let me show you now how it's fulfilled. Here's some ways that Jesus fulfills the law. Let me just rattle through these quickly. He fulfills the law in the way he lives. He lives it perfectly. 
He's the only man who's ever lived, who's perfectly lived out the law. Every single part of the Old Testament law perfectly lived out in Jesus. He is the embodiment of that beautiful life that God gave to Israel. No one has ever done that before. Never been seen before. Despite all the great people of the past of Israel, no one's ever been able to keep the law. But Jesus did. Kept it fully, kept it completely. Isn't that cool? So the law does not condemn Jesus. The law does not point the finger. The law simply says, look at him, look at him, look at him. Isn't he beautiful? It's almost as if the law, if it was personal, you can't really personify the law. But if it was, it'd be like a proud parent going, look, look. Look at him, isn't he beautiful? He's doing everything that, that I want, everything that I say. The law is fulfilled. But he also fulfills the law in his death. You see, Jesus lived it perfectly. But that doesn't really help us. Because we can look at him and go, oh great, isn't he beautiful? Great for him. But, but how does that help us? Well, it helps us because he lived it perfectly. And then he did this extraordinary thing. As the king of the kingdom of heaven, he came and he stepped into our place And he took the curse that I deserve for the law, my law breaking. And so Jesus has fulfilled all of the punishments of the law by dying on a cross. He's taken it all. He fulfilled it in his life and then he fulfilled it in his death. The law no longer condemns me because Jesus was condemned by it. Right? So if the law is a proud parent saying, oh, look at my son, isn't he beautiful? Look at, look at him. As the law looks at me, it says, you're disgusting, you're a disgrace, you failed, you've fallen short, you've fallen short. And Jesus says, yeah, but I'll save him. And Jesus steps into our place of failure. He steps into our place of weakness. He steps into our place of condemnation. And he takes the condemnation. He takes what the law demands so that he fulfills it perfectly. And he fulfills it in his teaching. Which is going to bring us on to the second point. You see, in in this first point, you can see, right? I've not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Jesus is so clear in verse 18. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He says there's still, the law isn't isn't disappearing. Every little tiny letter is still to be fulfilled. It still matters, everything. So when you know that Jesus has fulfilled the law, I think our response should be, oh, how I love your law. That we would learn to be people who love the law like it was meant to be loved. That we'd find our hearts not resisting and hating the law, not wanting to chuck it off, but actually wanting to embrace it. I love your law. And we would read God's law and we'd love it. Oh, how I love your law. Because as you love the law, you're actually loving Jesus because Jesus is the perfect representation of the law. But we need to move on, right? Because we've still got something really important to do because I still haven't helped you to work out about shrimps, okay? That's the next bit. So it lasts. God's word, it lasts forever. It, it, it continues forever. It hasn't changed. Verse 19, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, we will call least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What, what is Jesus teaching? It seems to me he's being very clear. He says, if you relax the Old Testament law, if you teach someone that they don't have to obey even the least of the commandments then you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is causing trouble, right? If you're thinking this is causing trouble, because like, shrimps, shrimps, what about the shrimps? Well, this is is how I want to sum this up, and then I'll explain it. 
What Jesus is doing here is he's not relaxing the law, but he's maximizing it. Not relaxing it, but maximizing it. <laughs> you see, that word sets aside one of the least of these commands. It, it literally means relax it. So perhaps we think, okay, fine, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he's come to make it slightly easier. He's taken out all the difficult commands, and he's just said, right, okay, with those, those are a bit over the top. Here, here, here's, here's how you should obey. And he's relaxed it. Jesus is very clear. He says, I haven't done that either. I've not abolished it. I've not relaxed it. not done either of those things. You don't ignore any of God's commands. You practice and teach those commands. And then he nails it in verse 18 with this extraordinary statement, which really would shock you if you lived in Jesus' day. So in verse 20, he says, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Right, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were like the experts in the law. They did it, right, as much as they could. They weren't, they weren't perfect, but they were more close than anyone else. And Jesus comes along and says, yeah, you need to surpass their righteousness. And the issue at stake is whether you're in the kingdom or not. <laughs> what? How do you do that? Okay. Let's push this a little bit. Okay, let's think. Let's think about this idea of fulfillment. What Jesus is doing is he's saying, now that the kingdom has, has come, we're no longer just an acorn, we're an oak tree. The law, as it was originally given, was an acorn, which is now grown to an oak tree. The righteousness of the Pharisees and the tax, uh, the tax collectors, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the righteousness of the Pharisees was acorn righteousness. That is what they were living by. They had the law and they were seeking to obey it. But Jesus is saying now that the kingdom has come, there is a oak tree righteousness which far surpasses any acorn righteousness. Okay, let's keep going with this. I'm going to keep doing this until, until we've all got it, okay? Let me, let me put it another way. You were all fairly happy, I think, most of you, that do not murder um, is a command we should still obey. Yes? Most of us were happy. Now you're nervous. Most of you were happy. Huh. I don't want to mess with your brains. But do not murder is an acorn law. Right? Do not murder is only the acorn of the law. That acorn law has been fulfilled in Jesus. So that acorn do not murder has now been maximized. It's not been shrunk, it's been maximized. So you say, how does Jesus maximize the acorn do not murder? Well, you're going to see this next week. He says, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I tell you, don't even get angry. That's the oak tree. That's the kingdom, right? Acorn, Israel, do not murder. Oak tree, kingdom, don't get angry. Do you see how it surpasses? Jesus is talking about a higher bar. He's talking about a higher standard of righteousness that he's calling us to live in the kingdom of heaven. He's going to give us a bunch of examples the next few weeks. Adultery, you've heard it said don't commit adultery. That's the acorn of Israel. Now, don't even look at a woman lustfully. Do you see how Jesus is maximizing the commands? The acorn commands are now fulfilled in Jesus and maximized. Okay, let's, let's keep going with this. What about the shrimp? This is the principle. This is how you do it, right? You say, the Old Testament says you must not eat shrimp because they're unclean. Now, what do we do? So we don't know to do that anymore. Ignore that. No, you know what to do now. That's an acorn law. 
So the question is, how does that acorn law get fulfilled in Jesus and in his kingdom? Jesus says it's not about what you eat and don't eat now. It's about being clean. It's about being pure. It's about living a pure life. So the acorn do not eat shrimp becomes the oak tree. Live a pure life. Get rid of sin. Don't allow uncleanness to live in your heart. Do you see? Do you see how the acorn becomes the oak tree? So do you have to still obey the shrimp law? Yes. In its fulfilled sense. Just like all of them. Okay, let me make it, right, this might make it clearer. (laughs) We're used to this idea, most of us who've been around church, we're used to this idea when it comes to sacrifices. So in the Old Testament law, in the Acon law, you had to take a lamb and sacrifice it and put its blood on the altar and then you'd be forgiven. That was an Acon law. Do we still need to keep that law? Not in its Acon form, but that doesn't mean it's gone. What you do is you say, how is it now fulfilled in the kingdom? How has it become an oak tree? Well, the oak tree in the kingdom is that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb who gave his life, whose blood was poured out, and who offered himself for us. So how do I keep the Acon law? By trusting the lamb. And every Old Testament law, you apply this way. What does it say? How is it fulfilled in Jesus? I want to live in that law. I want to live in the law of the kingdom, the fulfilled law. All right? That's why it will always surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees because that was just an acorn. Just to fill this in, this is always what God promised was going to happen. It was always his plan that the acorn would be fulfilled by an oak tree. He said this through the prophet Jeremiah. Have a look at these words. God knew that the law on its own was never going to be enough. So he said, this is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law, look at it, right? I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is the great promise. How is the acorn going to become an oak tree? It's because God is going to take the law and he's going to write it on our hearts. It's going to become something internal, not something external. It's going to become something that we want to do. It's going to become something that we delight to do. Let's wrap all this up and try and land all this. We've done, look, this, is, this is quite big, right? In the next few weeks, we're going to talk about anger, we're going to talk about lust, we're going to talk about kind of keeping our word, really practical. But we've got to see how it fits. In the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is bringing, Jesus the king goes to a cross and he dies. He dies for you because you cannot keep the law. He dies for you because the law will only condemn you. He gives his life so that you can be forgiven. He gives his life so that you can be welcomed into his kingdom. He gives his life to save you. And then he says to you, now live my law. I'll write it on your hearts. I'll put my spirit in you and the spirit of God will come and he will live with you and he will enable you to keep this law. And suddenly we begin to live a righteousness that even exceeds that of the Pharisees. All of this to say, if you ever think that Jesus saved you and therefore it doesn't matter how you lived, you are so wrong. Jesus said, I saved you so that you would live this oak tree righteousness. So that you would live this law. So that you'd live lives of love and justice and purity. So that you'd live lives where you care for the weak and you bind up the injured. You'd live lives of truthfulness. You'd live lives of purity. That's what he saved you for. That's the surpassing righteousness of the kingdom. So I wonder this afternoon, when you think about obeying Jesus, 
Is that something that brings you joy? Or is it something that makes you go, oh. Do you think of a Jesus' commands as being like a 20 mile an hour speed limit sign that says, no, you don't have fun here, no fun here, just drive slowly? Or do you see that the commands of Jesus are the loving, good, beautiful oak tree? That he says, this is, how I, this is what I made you for. Live this way. This is where freedom is found. Freedom is not found in abolishing the law. Freedom is found in understanding that Jesus has fulfilled the law and then saved us to live the law. Live the fulfilled law of Jesus. And if we do that, we will shine in this world. If we do that, we will put on display the glory of God. So this week, perhaps, as you go into this week, think, be saying to yourself, Lord, help me to love your law And help me to want to obey you. Grow within me a desire. Holy Spirit, give me a desire to obey. That I might do what you say. Because you're my king. Why don't we pray? Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we praise you so much for Jesus, our beautiful king. We praise you that he came and has fulfilled the law, that all of the potential of the Old Testament law has now found full flower in Jesus. That he lived it fully. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died for us and that you saved us, that we might now live this fulfilled law in our lives. So Lord, please teach us more about what this means. Help us to do this. Pray that you'd give us real understanding in the coming weeks as we dig more into what you teach us, that we might live as your beautiful people in this city and that we might put you on display. We ask it in your name. Amen. Great, we're going to sing together. We're going to sing um, a beautiful song that reminds us of Jesus. He came to fulfill the law and prophets. He came to be the king of kings. He came to bring us to God. So why don't we stand? if we're able, and let's sing together. Let's worship him.
appropriate we come together to finish our time together by celebrating um, the Lord's Supper, this simple, simple meal that Jesus gave us and said, this is how you are to celebrate me. And it's interesting that that meal, Jesus, when he took the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant, right? So that is The acorn of the old has been fulfilled in the oak tree of the new. And that is the covenant that we celebrate. That's the covenant we live in. A covenant of grace, a covenant of power to obey. It was the night before he died that Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, it's broken for you. And then he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The reason that we should be excited we don't live in the Old Testament is not because it was harder then, but because it was only the acorn. The standards now are higher. The bar is raised. The righteousness is greater because Jesus has come and he's poured out his spirit and he's forgiven us. And he's welcomed us into his kingdom. So as we come forward to eat and to drink, I I want to encourage you to come forward with a sense of joy that Jesus has done this for you. You couldn't keep the law. He died for you. But also come with a heart that says, Jesus, I want to obey you. I want to live this oak tree righteousness. Teach me, even in the coming weeks, teach me what it means to live this righteousness I'm going to lead us in prayer and then we will celebrate together Father thank you thank you for the bread that represents for us the body of Jesus thank you for the cup that represents for us the blood of Jesus Lord it it breaks our hearts to think that Jesus you had to give your body and your blood because we could not keep the law because we are unclean in your sight. But thank you, Lord Jesus, you were willing. Thank you that you came, you fulfilled the law completely and that you've saved us. And we pray that even as we eat and drink, we would know the joy of obedience, the joy and the freedom of living in this perfect, fulfilled law that you set out for us. Help us to live this, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're someone who is part of the kingdom of heaven, if you're someone who's trusting Jesus, if you're someone who says, Jesus is my king and he died for me, then we invite you, come eat and drink and celebrate with us. If that's not you, if you're sitting here and you think, I don't really know what I believe, then then stay where you are. No one's going to see who comes forward and who doesn't. Um, 
This is not some superstitious ritual. This is something very real for those who know him. So I'd encourage you not to come forward if, if that isn't you. But think over what we've heard. Um, but we're going to take some time. Um, now, come forward when you're ready. Um, if you hold on to the bread and wine, we'll eat and drink when everyone's been served as a way of saying we're together in this. Okay, so come forward, take a piece of bread and a cup. Um, there's gluten-free bread in the middle. The, the wine is all just grape juice. There's no alcohol. So um, come forward, take bread and wine, and we'll eat and drink together in a moment.
we're going to eat and drink together as a sign of our togetherness in trusting Jesus together in the kingdom of heaven. Let me pray. Oh Lord Jesus, how we love your law, how we love you, how we love your commands, how we love the freedom that you've won for us, how we love the joy it is to obey you. Lord Jesus, thank you that we love you because you first loved us and you gave your life. We worship you. Amen. We're going to finish our time together by um, by singing. We're going to sing a song that's a joyful song, come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, wonder, full of fear. We're going to sing about the joy that we can have because of being part of his kingdom. Um, so I invite you to stand with me one last time and let's, uh, let's celebrate and sing as we finish. stand before your maker full of wonder full of fear come behold his power and glory yet with confidence draw near for the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the god who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love Children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of. all our sorrows Jesus carried up the hill he has walked this path before us he is walking with us still turning tragedy to triumph turning agony to praise there is blessing in the battle so take heart and stand amazed rejoice when you cry to him Jesus, we ask you to help us to go out into this week to rejoice, to rejoice that you have fulfilled the law, that we don't live in the acorn, we live in the oak tree. We pray that we would live it and love it and rejoice in it. And even in our suffering, 
that we would know the joy of being in yours and of being part of your kingdom. Lord, teach us, we pray, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. Thanks so much for being here this afternoon, joining with us. um, If you're able to hang around, then there's food available. If you want to, if you're new here, then go and grab some people at the back over there and meet some people. Um, If you want a challenge for this week, if you want to kind of take what we've been talking about and work on it a bit, here's a simple challenge. Take the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Work through Ten Commandments and ask yourself, how does Jesus fulfill that acorn? How does he fulfill it? And what would it look like for me to live in the fulfilled law of the Ten Commandments? Start with those. You can do the shrimps later. Start with those. Have a go. See what, see what happens. And ask that Jesus would teach you to live in the fulfilled law of the kingdom. It's beautiful. Um, anyway, have a great week. I look forward to seeing uh, lots of you on Wednesday to pray and at other times in the week. God bless you guys.